what Richard did, which picked up five awards at the Irish Film and Television Awards. In 2009, Power received the highly coveted Hennessy XO Emerging Fiction Award and was the winner of the 2009 Mooney Prize for Irish Literature. His criticism has appeared in The New Yorker, Page Turner Blog, The Guardian, The Irish Times, Irish Independent, The Stinging Fly, and many other places. In 2021, White City, his much anticipated second novel, was published to wide acclaim. That's Kevin. Now, Rob's bio is a lot shorter, but that's just that that's what's written here. <laughs> Rob Doyle is the author of the story collection, This is the Ritual, and the novels, here, here Are the Young Men, recently made into a film, and Threshold, shortlisted for the Cary Group Irish Novel of the Year 2021. So, no I want to... No round of applause for you, Rob. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm going to op open asking you a question, Kevin, and then I have a question for you, and then I have some more general questions for both of you. Um, Kevin, I've been hearing a lot over the last couple of days um, about how writers have a really hard time, especially novelists, have a really hard time writing when they're reading other novelists, mm -hmm. that they sort of get into the voice of the novelist they're reading, and they get distracted, or they just can't read at all. Mm. Now you had kind of a different experience in breaking, eventually breaking your 10-year writer's block, but it was through criticism, really, mm. of other novels. Is that right? And would you say yes. more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I started writing criticism in the form of newspaper book reviews almost immediately after my first novel came out. And Caroline Walsh, the late and much missed editor, literary editor of the Irish Times, rang me up and said, will you review the new Ross O'Carroll Kelly? And I said, I love Ross O'Carroll Kelly. Yes, absolutely, I will. Um, and obviously, because I had written a novel about South Dublin rugby schools, um, which never seemed to be far from the news, um, I it seemed like a natural pick to Ross O'Carroll Kelly. And I, I, I never stopped doing those from 2008 to, to now. Um, I have written um, almost 450 um, 800 word newspaper book reviews. Um, so what I meant by kind of breaking the block was beginning to write longer essays, which is kind of the guts of this book are made up of longer pieces, um, which is a way of yeah, an 800 word review. If you're very lucky, you might smuggle an idea into it. Um, but broadly speaking, it's, it's, a, it's almost as reductive and constrained a form as the sonnet. You need to summarize the plot or, or thesis of the book under review, and you need to use some judiciously chosen adjectives to convey whether or not you think it's good. Um, and that's a kind of discipline, and it's, a, it's almost, you know, it, 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 you learn a lot about concision from doing that. But if you, H.L. Uh, Mencken, the great sort of cranky reactionary American critic and journalist said, if you do book reviews for long enough, eventually you start to want to get into thinking about ideas or thinking at all. And that, that was what I started doing, the longer essays for the Dublin Review of Books. Um, which I, I went to them and I said, can I please do these essays? And they said yes. And they've never said no to me, um, which is a risky strategy from their point of view, but uh, here we are. And uh, yeah, that was, that was what got me into, I hope, thinking beyond merely reacting to works of art as they come along. Although I think that has value, and that's why there's the shorter reviews, some of them are in this book as well. I think it has great value to, to write an 800-word response to a new book. And I mean, I, when Rob, whenever Rob publishes one of those in The Guardian, I, I, I click on it immediately because I know I'm going to get a, an excellent piece of writing with some thinking in it. And I think you're really superb at that, well, at that, that, that discipline of doing those. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is true that reading too much of other people's stuff is going to stop you writing your own. Um, so it's tricky. You have to, I'm, I'm, I'm about to send out a bunch of emails to editors saying no more for a while so that I can try and work on the novel that is sitting at my desk, shouting at me, telling me how bad it is, telling me how worthless I am. Um, you know, all the things that novels in progress tell you. Um, so it needs to give, I need to give it some attention. I need to give some less, I need to give less attention to reviewing for a while. Well, that's my hope. Okay. And on the subject of concision, Rob, did the 340 word limit that you set yourself um, for that column did that change the way that you were writing with your own work? Did it distill your own work more? Or Not did that necessarily my own work beyond that project. So just to explain what that refers to is when I was writing autobibliography, this book, uh, it was a newspaper column uh, for the Irish Times where every week for a year 
I got to write about uh, an old book, a pre-21st century book that had meant something to me or had inspired me or that I found, you know, that I wanted to rant about, I wanted to talk about. Uh, I kind of find I'm at my best um, talking about other people's books or as a critic or as a reviewer or whatever we want to call it when, uh, when it's something I love, when it's something I'm enthusiastic about. I, I, sometimes I enjoy, you know, sticking the, <laughs> sticking the knife in and, and twisting it a bit, but, uh, but basically I feel at my best and I write most freely when it's something evangelical, you know. So, uh, but that, that um, figure of 340 words was imposed on me by Martin Doyle, who's the editor of the Irish Times, the, the book's editor of the Irish Times. So, uh, and that's not a lot of words, you know, for anybody who doesn't uh, use <laughs> words professionally as their job, that's not a lot of words. And so, um, concision was forced upon me, and I had to act within those constraints, um, which was consistently frustrating, but also consistently an interesting challenge. Like Kevin has talked about the 800 word limit for the typical newspaper book review. And um, every time I write an 800 word uh, book review, you know, I email the editor saying, can I please just do 900? <laughs> and if they give me a thousand word book review, I'll, I'll be emailed them going, look, look, I know I'm always saying this, but can I have 1200 words this, this time, just this time? Uh, so, you know, you always have more to say than you can fit into the particular, you know, container that you're given. Um, but I, like I said, while it was frustrating on that level, it was also stimulating to have to... I started thinking of it like uh, the haiku, you know, this haiku, the, the form of the poetry, the form of poetry which is, um, is a very strict and very minimal kind of syllabic um, demand. Uh, so I was almost, in my pretentious uh, you know, inner thoughts, I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, this is almost like the book review version of the haiku. Mm. But um, <laughs> trying to convey a passion and why a book meant so much to me and why I think people should read it or, or whatever in that short space w was difficult. But then later when I decided to pump it up into a book, uh, I had total freedom because I decided to write this kind of split-screen book where, on one hand, you had these haiku-like uh, evangelical rants about books that I loved, some of which are maybe a bit obscure, others of which are really famous, Moby Dick or, or whatever. Uh, but on the other uh, screen, as it were, I wrote these autobiographical essays, uh, kind of fragmentary um, kind of non-linear in, in how they, they thread through the book, uh, autobiographical essays about reading, about my relationship to reading, about um, becoming a writer, about my relationship to literature. And I mean, in one sense, that's kind of a narrow subject, though, reading. But it, in another sense, it's the, the, the broadest subject there is, because reading, it's, it's this opening of oneself to the universe, to everything, to the cosmos, to history, to other cultures. Um, and so, of all the books, I've, I've written maybe four books, so far, or four published books so far, uh, of all of them, that was the most enjoyable, that was the one that was most pure pleasure to write, um, for a number of reasons. Thank you. Um, so, those reviews were books you felt evangelical about, but this is a question for both of you. In general, how do you decide... Are you assigned what you review? And if you don't like, if you flip through it and you think you don't like it, and I know the answer because <laughs> I've read your book, but if, if you find that you don't like it or you're probably not going to like it or you haven't liked this author's other books, do you say, mm, maybe, maybe, maybe somebody else, maybe not for me? <laughs> and if you don't, why don't you? And I have a, a question to follow that after, uh, after you answer this one. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm a hack. I never say no. Um, I, I re almost never do, unless I, I logistically cannot manage it um, or I'm sick or something. I, I never say no. Um, why? I, because I like them. I'm either I'm a masochistic in some way. I like doing it. I genuinely do like doing it. I like thinking about new books. And if I read it and I hate it, I mean, it, it, to me, there's a degree of professionalism there whereby that's what I say. Um, you know, I have agreed to take on the assignment. There have been, I can't, I, I, I can't think of any occasions where I have turned in a review and been told, 
we shouldn't have given you this book to do. We're going to we're going to pay you the kill fee, as they call it, and and, and spike it. Um, there was one instance where I reviewed Morrissey's novel. Um, remember Morrissey's novel? Oh, yeah. um, I re reviewed it for the Sunday Business Post, and I filed a review. And the next day, my editor, the wonderful Nadine O'Regan, called me up and she said, uh, "Kev, we've had the lawyers read that review." <laughs> Um, and they're, they're, and I said, oh no. And she said, no, no, they've passed it, but they did say it was the worst review of anything they'd ever read. <laughs> um, I did have, one was almost spiked, which was when I gave Colin McCann a bad review, also for the Sunday Business Post. And again, the lawyers called me up and said, um, did Colin McCann you know, leave your sister at the altar or run over your dog? And I said, no, he just wrote a very bad novel. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, it, it is it, the fr front line evaluative criticism, which is what reviewing is. You know, it's, it, 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 it has a duty on some level to try and sort, according to the standards of taste of the individual reviewer, the bad from the good, um, which is not, which is to set aside the kind of frisson we all get from reading a, a hatchet job. Um, so you say, uh, and it's very interesting to me that you say evangelical reviews are easier for you to write because the opposite is true of me. If I like something, I find it very hard to write a good review because there's, it seems there's, the, the vocabulary of praise is, is impoverished compared to the vocabulary of damnation. I don't know why that should be. But I, wrote, I write bad reviews very quickly. They're very satisfying to do, and they're gone. They're out of there. Um, it's sometimes an hour, and I, 800 words an hour, done. Um, and I have, and, you know, nobody listens to me. Nobody, you know, I, I said Douglas Stewart was terrible. Nobody listens to me. Douglas, everybody loves Douglas Stewart. Who, by the way, is my client. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did not know that. That's awkward. Um. <laughs> well, but, 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 let me, but let me follow up with, the, here's the thing. Every writer is somebody's son, client, you know. So, you know, and you yourself, or a novelist. Mm. So let me ask you, did you read the reviews of your own book? Oh yeah, everybody reads reviews of their books. Anybody who says they don't is just lying. Um, and I see, you see, sometimes see someone sort of standing around at a, at a book launch or something, with, you know, with a, they should have a cigarette, but they can't because they're indoors, but they say, oh no, I never read my reviews. Uh, but this is of course a lie. Um, they are, Norman Mailer once said that um, a, a review of your own book is like walking along a street at night and seeing a naked person in an open window. He says, you're going to look. It's interesting. <laughs> even, if they're, even if you're not into them, it's the wrong gender or whatever, you're going to look. Under those circumstances, it's interesting. And he's absolutely, he's absolutely right. Um, I, I, do, I do know people who don't read their own reviews, um, who don't re read reviews of anything, who won't see any press at all. Inter even if they've done interviews, they won't go near it for just to keep their, their sanity. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I'm beginning to think is extremely valuable. Mm, but that yeah. leads me to another question, <laughs> and maybe you want to take this one. What are reviews for? Who is your audience when you write a review? Well, uh, just to answer that while also going back to the previous question, I have uh, sent back books where, you know, sometimes where I've initially pitched the, the, the editor of whichever newspaper or publication it is and asked to review a given book because I thought it looked really interesting. And then the book will be sent to me. And I'll read 100 pages or something and realize I'm having a terrible time reading this book. And on, it hasn't happened often, but on a couple of occasions, I've gotten back in touch with the editor and said, look, I know I pitched uh, to review this book, but I would really love to uh, duck out if possible. If not, you know, if that's too awkward, I'll just do it. But uh, it's... And usually they'll say, yeah, that's fine. You know, let's just, let's just pretend that never happened. <laughs> the reason I would do that rather than, you know, giving it a, a, a damning review is because often they will be the kind of books that uh, people may not get to hear about anyway, mm. uh, you know, or, or only, you know, let's say specialist readers, kind of literary nerds, you know, will, uh, of, of which I include myself, will probably hear about. So the idea of me dragging a book out in front of the public just to say, look how crap this is, mm. it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but more often than not, I will pitch the, I'm the exact opposite of Kevin in that <laughs> if I really think I've no interest in a book or if it's about, I just won't review it because um, I tend to pick and choose what I read. I think I'm quite a slow reader. Uh, I read constantly, but I read at quite a slow pace. And so um, I tend to be very picky and choosy about what I read. 
And uh, I think when I first started out reviewing books for this Irish Times, ex exactly the same as Kevin, it was very immediately after I published my first book, I kind of reviewed everything that came to me for a while, just because I wanted to get on the good side of the editors. Um, but, but not long after that, I decided, you know what, I, I'm better when I'm writing about... First of all, I'm better at writing about a writer with whom I have, uh, uh, let's say, a long-standing relationship. Obviously, that can't be the case if it's the first novel. But if they have a few novels under their belt, and I've read a few of them, uh, I'll be able to write something deeper about them. Um, I think the, the only real hatchet jobs, maybe not the only ones, but the, the worst reviews I've written would tend to be of um, colossal figures, or just huge figures, or, or authors who've been around mm. a long time, because uh, I don't feel there's a kind of ethical obligation. It's not that there's not an ethical obligation. I think reviewing is an ethical thing for all sorts of reasons. But there isn't as... I don't feel I need to be as um, cautious if it's somebody like Karlo Vicknevsgaard or, or whoever, because uh, they can take it, you know? They've sold millions of books, they're world famous, all of that, and they're probably publishing quite frequently, and so if they have a new book, um, that's not up to standard, I think it's totally fair game to really lay into it if needs be. I don't really feel the same if it's a debut author or if it's not even a debut author, but somebody who isn't of that level. I think there's all sorts of factors. And I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying you should just be, you know, um, you should treat them with kid gloves, you know, the right. Obviously, your main duty is to the readership of whichever publication you're reading. You want to give them your opinion, you know. But um, there are all, all sorts of other factors that come into it that make it kind of complicated. It's a treacherous business for me. And actually, one thing I stopped doing quite early on is uh, reviewing um, my, contempt my Irish contemporaries because uh, it gets fucking awkward. Because <laughs> you meet them, you know? You meet them all, and that that's how for me. Yes. It's like uh, curb your enthusiasm levels of... Uh, <laughs> cringe, you know, um, if, you've, if you've given them a damning review. So, that's, yeah. And I, I have a question about the pleasure of reading, right? I guess this is more a question for you because I think you kind of answered it, but, you know, when I don't like a book that I'm, you know, if I've started a book I've been excited about, maybe I'll give it, I'll usually give it 25 pages, then I might give it another 50 just to see if it's been something that's recommended to me. But after that, I just have to put myself out of my misery. <laughs> and every now and then I'll keep going because I'm curious to know what's all the hype about. I want to get, you know, to sort of get to it and figure it out. And then I find out, oh, God, there's no there there. And maybe I'll, I'll give up 50 pages before it's over. But if you're reviewing books that you think are really terrible, isn't that, a, isn't that just a miserable experience? You know, isn't that, doesn't it put you in a terrible mood for days? Should ask my wife, I guess. Um, possibly. I don't know that. I don't know that it affects my mood at this point significantly because I pro I've just professionalized it to such a degree that I I read it, I re think about it, I write the review, I file the review, and I I move on. Um, I don't tend to linger too much over it once it's done because it's not that kind of writing. Um, novel takes a long time, or a book of any kind takes a long time, and it requires you to sit with it in different moods and to nurture it and to worry over it, fret over it, you know, bring it to life slowly, bit by bit. But a review is it's journalism, you know, not to, not to slight journalism. It's a, a wonderful thing requiring many complex skills, but it is, it's, it, 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 you, it, you operate at speed, you do it, it's worth doing. And I genuinely, I generally think what, if, I, if I give a, a book a bad review nowadays, it will be in the spirit of trying to give a counter appraisal of something that is being widely admired. And I think that's an important function of a critic. If, not to sound very, that sounds very pretentious, but it is. Um, if everybody thinks a book is amazing, and I can see what are to me visible, radical faults, um, it is, I think it is important to get those observations on record to some degree. Um, and it's funny, if you, when you publish a bad review of, 
of a, of a well-known novelist, um, people email you and say, I, don't, I can't say this on Twitter, or I, can't, I don't want to say it to anyone, but you're absolutely right to have published that review, which makes me feel great. I feel brave and uh, like I'm you know, speaking up for, <laughs> I don't know, a very small and bitter minority of readers. But, <laughs> um, but it's, it's important because if you, have, if you have kind of total consensus on the worth of a book, something's gone wrong. Nobody's doing any real thinking about it. Um, it is worth coming along and saying, hang on a minute, is this actually any good using what standards that I've gleaned from 20 years of thinking and reading and writing? So you imply then, and this is one of the questions that's actually on the pamphlet, what, what makes a, a, a book good? And you imply that there are good books and bad books. Mm. Um, I feel the same way, I'm sure you feel the same way. And yet we all have, I mean, maybe you have closer taste to each other than you do to me, but we all have our own taste. We all have different taste. Mm. Taste is such a big part of mm. the business, isn't it? So do you not feel some obligation to, <laughs> you know, to say this kind of thing isn't really to my taste? Mm. I don't really like maximalist American fiction. But if you're, you know, if the, if you like that kind of thing, you know, um, he, I, you, I, I, don't, I mean, I, I'm thinking of, of there are books that are wildly successful and popular mm. that, that, you know, if I were writing a review, I would cut, that, cut down to size. But on the other hand, I'm not the reader for them in, in mm. the first place. So do you think there's some obligation from the reviewer to also say, you know, by the way, obviously this isn't, this isn't my bag. Mm. Um, and does that have anything to do with a book being good or not? Rob, I feel like I've been rabbiting on a bit. Yeah, well, I mean, I think yes. I think trying to, um, sometimes trying to take oneself out of the equation is a part of it for me. You know, trying to re remember and realize that I have, in a sense, quite narrow taste, mm. actually, and that not everything is going to, do it for me, and a lot of stuff that people get really excited about, you know, and I'm sure this is probably a common uh, experience mm. to, to, to writers in particular, but a lot of stuff that people get wildly excited about, I, I just don't care, I ju I'm just not interested. Uh, and then stuff that I'm wildly excited about seems to be a very niche interest. So I do try to bear that in mind, but for that reason I also try to mainly review stuff that I'm excited about, or at least potentially could be really excited about. Um, but Fairly early on, I think one of the things I try to do with each book that comes my way to review, whether I ask to review it or whether it was sent to me, is first and foremost to try to understand and figure out what the writer is trying to do. You know, not to bring my pre conceived paradigm of what makes a good book to the table and then damn a book or praise a book for how badly or how well the book lives up to that preconceived paradigm but rather to go in and kind of leave that paradigm aside first and foremost and try to figure out where's the author going with this what are they trying to do um, and it seems to me to be a better way to get to the heart of the matter and try to say something which may be of value, hopefully is of value and is of interest um, beyond the limitations of my taste, uh, my preferences, my whims. You know? But at, having said that, at the end of the day, every review does come back to your own subjectivity, mm. your own whims, and so on. It's just a part of the kind of apparatus that I try to use, is to get outside myself a little bit to understand the author and understand what they're trying to do. Mm. And part of that is understanding that there are huge readerships out there that will be very genuinely, profoundly excited by some stuff that doesn't really do it for me. Mm. Um, that said, you know, there are some books that are just so obviously and immediately outside of my range of interest that I just won't review them. Because what's the point? I'm just not the I'm just not the guy for the job. So, I want to go back to a question I asked before that I feel like I'm not quite satisfied with the answer. What is a review for? What it, what it, who who is your audience? 
when you're writing and who and when it publishes is is, is the audience the same um, is the audience the people in this room tonight um, and um, and you know what what are the for, for you um, what are the most important parts of saying whether a book is good or not mm. and you know what it, and this is obviously for, for both of you mm. um, and I do and I do want it that that question what makes a, a book good you know it would be wonderful if you could, if you could tell us as well okay um. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here, I mean, here's what reviews are for. Rob reviewed a book for The Guardian. Uh, it's a while ago now, but it's called Sell Us the Rope by Stephen May, oh, yeah. um, which is a novel about a young Stalin uh, going to London to attend a, a, a conference of socialist revolutionaries. And um, I hadn't heard of it before. I read the review because Rob, Rob had reviewed it, and I always read his reviews. And, I, and he, you made it sound like something I would like to read, so I bought the book, and I read it, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what reviews are for, the most kind of obvious, you know, um, practical level, they are to bring your attention, if you were a reader, uh, to books that you might enjoy, might benefit from reading. Um, so in, in that instance, the system worked. Um, they're also, they also serve a kind of, you know, counter function, which is to warn you off books that you, you, you won't really get anything out of, or that you think other people will get less out of than they could. Um, I think that's, that's what they're for. What makes a book good? I'm not a snob, genuinely I'm not a snob. I read everything. I read all, across all genres, uh, all modes, all the time. Um, science fiction, thrillers, romance, uh, historical novel, uh, non-fiction, everything. I read everything. Um, and uh, so I'm not, I, I, I don't believe that the finely honed literary novel um, is, is some sort of, uh, you know, uh, gold standard of, 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 the no of, of the book. Of course it's not, you know. Mm. Um, what I what I dislike are are kind of fake or or or, or poorly poorly managed or poorly handled examples of a given form. Um, so if you've got a writer who can't you know make a character come alive with anything other than cliches or you know the the, the prose equivalent of a kind of big mustache and you know twirling the face, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. If you know, if you've got tons of cliches you know on the page, if you've got dialogue that sounds like no human being could really ever say it naturally. Uh, you know, um, that's, you know, I, I get annoyed at that, and I do want to, I do feel the urge to express my, my annoyance with that. I don't like kitsch, and I don't like fake, uh, a fake art of any kind. Um, and I think it's important to identify it because we are subsumed by kitsch. We are drowning in bullshit um, as a culture, as always. We always have been, we still are. Um, and it's extremely important to stand there with your tattered, you know, banner saying, no, there are good ways of doing everything. Um, they're not there because of canon law. God didn't tell us to do them this way. They're there because over many generations, smart people have figured out what works and what hasn't. <laughs> there is a body of knowledge that tells you what makes a book good. And if you are curious, it is written down and you can go and find out um, what it is. So I think that's, that's as close as we get to an objective standard for, for as, as reviewers. You measure your own taste, and everyone, of course, has taste, and you can't argue with it, as the saying goes, but you measure your own taste against that body of knowledge, which is there to guide taste and to educate taste. Um, one of the problems with most English degree programs is that they don't really educate taste. They educate kind of critical, the critical mind um, to look at culture in a kind of critical way, but they don't necessarily spend much time thinking about what makes a book good. Um, you know, why is Jane Austen better than Amanda McKittrick Ross, the famously bad uh, romance novelist of the 19th century? Um, why is Vladimir Nabokov better than Graham Greene? These are interesting questions. <laughs> and not that Graham Greene is bad as such, but he can't write a sentence like Nabokov. Anyway, they, there are, there, there's a body of knowledge that we can use and, and, and bring to bear on a new book whether that's the canon of science fiction, if you're really viewing a new science fiction novel, or it's the canon of memoir, whatever. There are standards there that you can, you can use to measure a new book. And that's one of the, one of the jobs of, of the reviewer, the frontline you know, evaluator of, of new books. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, I, the, the first part about reviewing, I completely agree with Kevin that it will, one of the primary task, first of all, is just to inform, you know, there's this book out and here's what it's about. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. 
But the other thing, personally, that I would add to the mix in terms of what a review reviews for is uh, we shouldn't um, neglect to think about or to, to, to bear in mind the reviewer's uh, writerly vanity, their <laughs> writerly, yeah. um, you know, w when I'm writing, I'm trying to do many things, but one thing I'm pretty much sadly always trying to do is kind of show, show off. off. <laughs> show off. <laughs> it's, true, it's true, you know, um, and I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. I think, you know, Bob Dylan was trying to show off when he wrote yeah. his genius songs in, yeah. in the 60s or whatever. You know, you name it, that, it it's always in there. But um, as soon as I started writing book reviews slash criticism, literary essays, all of this stuff, I didn't, almost immediately, I didn't put it less, you know, lower down on some perceived hierarchy of literature, even than novels, even than the novels I wrote. A little bit. I mean, it's obviously a more transient thing and, and so on. But basically, w whenever I write, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, somewhere in between, whether it's for uh, a newspaper, you know, whether it's in, bound in the covers of a book, I'm trying to write beautiful sentences and um, intelligent sentences and sentences that have intensity and power and... Uh, grace and conviction and all of that stuff, the stuff that turns me on in books in the first place, mm -hmm. the stuff that keeps me coming back to books. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, never, I've never written reviews in any other spirit than that. And that's why, um, you know, much like Kevin, I now have a book <laughs> containing some of the stuff that I've written in newspapers, and I'm, I'm currently working on a, a couple of things, but one of them is a book that will... Uh, hopefully, you know, contain a lot of the literary essays and reviews and criticism and so on that I've written down the years. Because right in my mind from the word go, as soon as I started writing that stuff, it's like, someday I'm going to put this in a book. You know, it's all, it's, that's always in the back of my mind. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of writers, a lot of reviewers who are also writers of fiction or of you know, short stories or uh, of books in general are always thinking about that. I always have a little part of my mind going, yeah, you know, this newspaper will be in the bin in a week and, you know, nobody will be looking at the online thing anymore because they'll have moved on to the next thing, but this is going in my next book. Mm. I suspect that's the case. <laughs> it's certainly been the case for me and presumably for Kevin. Oh, big you, time, yeah. yeah, you've yeah, gone done it. yeah. yeah. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot, and you don't have to answer the question if nothing comes to mind. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but if there's if if um, a particular um, piece of critical work, whether it's a review or a critical essay or even a personal essay that brings um, books into the essay, is, is there one in particular that, that that comes to mind that had really stuck with you? Because it is we do think of reviews as things that come and go, and you know that, but. But um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, di the difference between reviews and critical essays. Um, but as you say, you're writing them for the sentences as well. Mm. So are there any particular that come to mind that you've just really admired and that you think about and that you uh, that come from, back to? From other writers. Yeah, from other writers. <laughs> <laughs> One that immediately comes to mind, this was when I was, I don't know, 19, 20, in, uh, uh, 19 or 20, I read uh, na um, Lolita by Nabokov. I was, uh, who Kevin already mentioned, and that book completely blew me away, which you know, which it, it will do. Um, but the book began with a, an introductory essay by a writer I think I'd never heard of, called Martin Amis, <laughs> who later became an obsession, um, probably an obsession at one point. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a great, a great, like a master of the sentence, yeah. you know, and a, a great writer. Uh, He's annoying. There's all sorts of criticism we could level at him. But anyway, he completely transformed my vision of what a sentence could be. But when I read this introductory essay about Lolita and about everything that this author found rapturous and wonderful and amazing about this book, I remember thinking, wow. I'd never really had the experience before that a critical piece of writing like that could be as ecstatic and uh, give you that sensation of having your kind of your whole brain lighting up with with with, with electric kind of light uh, as novels themselves can and so uh, that that's one that really mm. touched something off for me i must go back and reread it 
That's a great essay. Mm. Yeah, but Martin Amos, is, he collected most of his criticism in a book called The War Against Cliché, which at one point I, I was literally never t more than three feet away from it's me. so good. When yeah. I was about 23 or 24. It's a phenomenal book. Yeah. Um, a work of art in and of itself, even though it's, it's stuck, just repeated. He's stuck in nicely in plenty. Too. Plenty, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, 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 you could accuse him of being the kind of critic who does have a pre-ordained uh, idea of what constitutes greatness in prose yeah. and applies it rigorously to what's in front of him and just throws away, dismisses anyone who doesn't match that template, although I, that's slightly unfair. Um, but yeah, he's, he's you know, uh, of the, the, the dwindling few literary men um, I think we're all in Amos' shadow to some extent um, because he defined so thoroughly what it means to be a, a man of letters, um, a writer um, for a certain generation. And that, those figures come along and it, it, can be, it can be a task to get yourself out from under that shadow. Um, but yeah, but the, for me, the, 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 a book, Amos, yes, a, a, as with Rob, but a, a book that, or even an essay that absolutely blew my mind was, um, was Susan Sontag's Against Interpretation. Um, oh, yeah both book and essay. Um, there's, there's, it's astonishing to look back at that book now, and, and most of it's just book reviews, incredibly. She did her thinking via the book review. Now, she had a bit more space. She was writing for Partisan Review in the 50s and 60s. She had a bit more leeway in terms of what she could write about, and she's writing for a, a limited, relatively highbrow audience. Um, but that book uh, basically kind of contains a set of, a set of essays that are, that are so densely woven, and so every corner has just been thought out, and there's, there's nothing you can add to them, there's nothing you can take away. They're, what's that word? Um, lapidary, that's the word. They are, yeah, they're absolutely extraordinary, and they're, I, I, I read them all the time. I just read, I'll even just read a couple of pages. Just that line in the review of, it's about Camus' notebooks, and the first line of the essay is something like, great writers are either husbands or oh, lovers. Yeah. Um, and then she goes on to say, notoriously, women tolerate behavior in a lover that they would never tolerate in a husband. And I think, bloody hell, that is, that, that's genius. It's yeah. It was a book review, you know? But the quote's so good, I stuck it in this. Oh, is it in there? I, I, uh, I haven't read that since it came out, I'm sorry. I couldn't I even, remember. Uh, because my, my word count was so limited, I was agonizing. <laughs> I had to cut off a couple of lines of the quote, you know, spent yeah. uh, about an hour going, oh, I want to squeeze more. <laughs> it's it's great, the, the haiku was I, worth it. Yeah, yeah. she's a great, a great choice. Yeah. Now, Kevin, you um, you just said something that made me look at my watch to see is it the time yet when I can when I can ask the question that I know you both want to be asked? Where are all the young male novelists? <laughs> oh God, uh, Rob. <laughs> um, young male authors? I don't know. Um, I, if this is a crisis, I I'll, I'll take your word for it. You know, you being the, the culture <laughs> at large, because I seem I seem to have heard this a few times. Maybe it is. I. I I tend not to be uh, paying total attention to what's going on absolutely at the moment in terms of the publishing world. But if I had to hazard a guess, just going by a mixture of kind of observation and uh, caustic prejudice and all sorts of stuff, <laughs> I, I would suggest that young men who might glance towards the contemporary literary scene probably look at it and kind of go, all right. There's, that's not where the action is. That's not. It doesn't look very inspiring. I, I just. I think back to myself mm. when I was in my early twenties. I wanted at least the hint of danger, of of uh, that kind of frisson, of uh, deviance, of um, <laughs> extreme sensations. You know, uh, all, all sorts of stuff that, when I look at the contemporary literary scene, or at least the topsoil of mainstream publishing. It seems to me a, a radically gentrified zone mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways. Um, sanitized, quite censorious. You know, everyone's, everyone's an activist, uh, not just a writer anymore. They're an activist and writer. And um, good, good for them, you know, <laughs> if that's their thing. If that's sincerely their thing, good for them. But it's become the kind of hegemony in the, in the world of letters, from what I can see. And that's gratifying to some and quite dead and dull and alienating mm. to others. And um, I wouldn't say young men, this, again, I don't have any kind of uh, statistical evidence or anything like that. This is all off the cuff. But I wouldn't say they've stopped reading or anything like that. You know, I would say they're probably just kind of 
digging or doing what I did, you know, which is kind of ignoring what was going on yeah. in the immediate culture and digging into um, not just the past, but uh, looking around and, and, and finding something that, that, had, that just had more life and vitality to it. It's, it's a kind of ongoing um, mm. uh, caustic uh, fixation of mine, finding that the culture, through all sorts of things, social media and the kind of new pressures that we're under psychically, that the culture has in some ways become quite dead and deadening and um, overly safe. And uh, the wild freedom of expression and creativity and madness even that for me most of the great literature uh, and great art that I've always responded to and loved um, isn't really isn't exactly um, rewarded or nurtured or nourished in this um, very um, often self-righteous sanctimonious kind of moralizing culture as I see it you know you maybe many of you disagree with me but uh which is all to say that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's an element of just kind of indifference for young men towards contemporary literature. That said, if someone is burning up with enough passion and uh, hunger and lust for power and glory and all that stuff that lurks <laughs> in the heart of every writer, uh, they'll, they'll get there eventually and they'll write their books. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a massive kind of wave of... Uh, maybe quite transgressive new authors, not necessarily male, but uh, just as a kind of uh, backlash against this very prissy, um, fussy, gentrified cultural scene we've had for the last seven or ten years or whatever it is. That's my two cents on the question. Hmm. I, I think there's, there's a few things going on there. I mean, one th my friend Claire Kilroy just uh, has a new novel out next year. Um, it's called Soldier Sailor. I'm um, coming at May 2023 20, from Faber. And I, she just sent me a proof of it this week. And I was, I was reading it. And it is about motherhood. And it's about what it means to be pushed to the verge of psychotic depression by the simple fact of having a newborn baby who's completely dependent on you, you, mother. And it's just the two of you, and that's it, and you're in it. And it's absolutely extraordinary. It's harrowing and devastating and it's I, you know it, uh, I, after about eight pages I was already in tears but it reminded me of something that Anne Enright said a few years ago which is that women sit down to write and there's so much she says about being a woman that hasn't been written down yet um, and this second wave feminism is about a half a century old uh, which is nothing there still is so much to write so I think women writers you know I, I kind of accept a lot of what Rob says and agree with it. But I also think that women writers are now energized in a way that they have never been, um, ever, <laughs> before now. And that they are emboldened and to write down this stuff that hasn't been written down before. And that's phenomenal. Whereas when I sit down to write fiction, I have to throw away all of the ideas that are basically, I'm a middle-aged writer, I'm depressed, and I'm kind of horny. Um, <laughs> because we've got that book. And it's, and it's good, and we did it, and that's fine. Um, whole, I think the whole, whole century's worth. Whole, whole worth. I, I think the challenge for male writers now is to figure out what about being a man hasn't been written down yet. Uh, maybe nothing, but maybe something. In fact, it's got to be something. Um, and I, one of the things that it, it, I would want to, I would, I would read a novel about or, or a book of some kind about is a visible, palpable demoralization among men under 30 in Western country, countries right now. It's there, I see it. I teach, um, I teach undergrads and I see it in them. And I, I, I teach uh, even postgrads who are older and I see it, they, they're very demoralized. They, they, they don't know what they're for, they don't know who they are. There's all kinds of complex reasons why that should be. But I would read something that did some thinking about that or that even just reported on it from the front line of, of, of the experience. A novel, uh, you know, by a young man who could give us insight into that, I think it would be valuable. I think it would be interesting and useful. That's my two cents. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I've got more, but I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, 
you've just told us about, what is your friend's novel called? It's called Soldier Sailor, Claire Kilroy. Soldier Sailor, yeah. coming out when? In May 2023 from Faber. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, can you, it, it, again, I don't want to put you on the spot if nothing comes to mind, but is there, it, are there any novels you've read recently that you've just felt were absolutely wonderful and that we should hear about from mm -hmm. you fine critics? So, uh, you, you answer what okay, I you think. think of um, I don't you know don't have to. I don't want to no, put you on sure the spot. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I can't bloody think of anything either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why does this always we, happen? Not what we hate. No, that's another No, story. I understand. It's very hard to be. Does, have, does it have to be kind of a recent, a recent novel, a new, a new novel, contemporary? Well, n no, but I, but I, I do want to say one thing about. I mean, from from my perspective as a literary agent, reviews are extremely important. Mm. They. They, you know, as you say, their function is to send somebody to the bookshop to buy the book yeah. or not to. And that's, you know, it's about commerce mm. at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's extremely important, in, you know, in my, in, in, you know, to, 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 my, um, to my career mm. that my authors be reviewed, mm. period, yeah. and that they be reviewed well. Um, and so... Sorry about the Douglas Stewart thing. Oh, gosh. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think he survived. I think he's he survived. okay. Yeah, he'll, 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 he's okay. Well, no, he's a, yeah, 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 sure, he'll be okay. Um, I don't know if I'll be okay, no. Um, but, it, but I, you know, so it's, it's a question I think about all the time. Um, you know, where, where, you know, where do we, how do we decide what we're going to buy? We're all readers in this room. How do we decide when we go to the bookshop? Um, is it our friends' recommendations? Is it reviews? Is it social media? Is it the jacket? Um, is it the blurb from the author, from other authors? Um, you know, how, how do we decide? And you have such an important role in all of that. Um, and, you know, something I, I admire and respect a great deal. Um, so, uh, I, I guess the we, we can skip the sort of last book that you loved, and um, but sure. I but I, I you know the reason I bring it up is because um, Martin Amis, Nabokov, they're going to be they're going to be read and they're mm. going to be read again. And um, if you know if you're a new writer, a young writer, um, the, as you said, that review that Rob wrote mm. that made you go to the bookstore and mm. buy the book by this unknown writer, hugely important, yeah. right? Mm. Um, so before I turn things over to the audience, I want to ask you just about Twitter and yes. whether Twitter is, um, first of all, are you going to remain on Twitter if you're on Twitter? Yes. And second of all, is it um, a good place to voice opinions about books? Is it a place where you <laughs> learn about other books? Is it an appropriate place for many reviews, et cetera? I would say the, what I was talking about earlier about the kind of gentrification and the banalization <laughs> and the, yeah. um, the kind of sanitization and the, the making tedious of, of so much in the contemporary cultural scene. So much of it could be boiled down to one word, and that word is Twitter. Ooh, I think. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, I've been watching this whole Elon, Elon Musk kind of bringing <laughs> it to its knees with a kind of uh, a sick glee um, because. Because I feel a, a kind of a personal uh, enmity towards that platform, even though I've used it. Uh, somebody sent me a, a, a heading, uh, a, an article from The Atlantic yesterday, and it was, uh, what are writers going to do <laughs> if Twitter <laughs> implodes? And uh, he, he didn't even need to comment on it because he knew what I would think about it. It's like Twitter, by creating a space that actively kind of shuts down and controls uh, free thinking and... Um, wild uh, flights of thought and imagination and so on, and polices everything and homogenizes everything and uh, gives outsized power to a very arrogantly moralistic kind of subsection of society, um, has done, to me, clear, obvious damage to, um, not to literature, because that's always going to go on, but to the kind of contemporary scene of uh, what what becomes available to us what becomes uh, visible to us so I think and and but also it's a real graveyard for writers I think I've seen it happen um, to writers who stay on there something seems to happen to their psyche it's like any addiction um, it's impacting you and it, it, it's changing your relationship to the world and to 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 everything and uh, 
writers who can start out very promising, I think if they spend too long on there, they just become a Twitter person, one of those Twitter personalities, deformed and mutilated in some ways. Rob, I'm sitting right here. (laughs) 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 I mean, I I really wasn't talking about Kevin there. I was was probably talking about myself, to be honest, because there was a time when I was quite active on there, but now I look back on it, and I see how it maimed and mutilated me, and I see... I. Now I still have an account that uh, every few months I'll, I'll kind of go back in and I'll post up all of the articles I've written, but uh, I'd never read it anymore. I don't engage with it much, but um, it, what I notice is as a person in general, but also particularly as a writer, uh, I have so much more bandwidth, so much more freedom, uh, headspace by being out of that world. But I don't want to be too, you know, smug or sanctimonious about it either. That's just my experience of it. I quite like Twitter. Um, <laughs> I like Instagram. That's, <laughs> that's the, the horrible thing. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's a game, Twitter. It's not, you know, pe- people who think it's some sort of, you know, global agora or, 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 you know, even a tool for self-promotion or communication, they're wrong. It's a game. You post some bullshit, you get some likes. You know, if you don't get enough likes, you just try again next round. It's like pulling the slot machine arm. Um, so I don't take it very seriously. It's something to kind of while away the time. You know, it might as well be Tetris or something. Um, and may, this may I interrupt you to ask yeah. that game? Do you think it's fair to writers um, to, to, to make to, to make them a, a, a subject of that game? Well, nobody makes them a subject of the game. They make themselves a subject of that game. By publishing you, a book. You, no, 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 no. You go on by going on Twitter. That's yeah. the deal we all make with social media. We hand over our attention uh, in exchange for being sold products and having our data tracked and harvested. Um, that's the deal. That's the social media deal. Um, but it incentivizes kind of more and more outlandish or hectoring or often sanctimonious yeah, yeah. viewpoints, and therefore creates and incubates a certain type of writer who then gets the book deal from Twitter, which has happened yeah. many, many times. Maybe some people find that, that kind of writer interesting, but <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's, uh, it, I'm sure there are some questions. I, I have a microphone, yeah. Oh, I don't need a microphone. Um, oh, good, okay. I haven't got a question. Oh. I'd love to hear both voices. So, is it possible, Rob, that you would read a little extract from that one? Is that okay? Like Absolutely. That sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. To hear the writing that we've been discussing. Yeah, yeah. I'll read a bit that. Um, Thank you. That's all questions. This is towards the end of the book. This is, like I say, a book about books, a book about reading. Is there a book you wish you. This is a short section. Is there a book you wish you'd read at a younger age? A book you wish you'd never read. Which book damaged you the most? Which novel did you give to girls or to guys to help them understand you? Did you steal any books? Which ones? Which book did you give up reading with 60 pages to go and thereafter always regret not finishing, knowing it was somehow too late? Which novel did you leave on a train and never learn how it turned out? Have you fallen in love with or had a crush on a fictional character, been sexually aroused by reading? Have you gotten yourself off to a book? Is there an author you found yourself thinking more about than you did any person in your real life? How much about a novel can you remember after you've read it? Was Schopenhauer right when he claimed we remember our lives only a little better than a novel we once read? How well do you remember? Which scene do you wish you could forget? Which chapter would you most like to reread? When you get to the last page, will you want to turn back to the start? and read it again, or will you be relieved that it's over? It goes on and on. You get the gist. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll read a bad review. Why not? (laughs) As long as it's not by one of my clients. (laughs) How do you feel about Paul Auster? Go right ahead. Great. I've I've given him hell as well. Yeah, well, he 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 deserves it. Um, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Published the, this is from a review it's of the same book, is it? 4321. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrible, awful, and it was uh, not 900 pages of that's terrible. Massive as well. yeah, yeah, I won't read the whole review, I'll just read the, the, the first little bit. Uh, but the novel came out in 2017. First thought, best thought, 
wrote Jack Kerouac, offering perennial encouragement to the sort of writer who never has any thoughts at all. <laughs> Since anyone's first thought about anything is likely to be a cliche, the business of literature should be to look for the last thought, or at the very least, to declare war on the stock response. Paul Auster is a first thought writer who has somehow acquired the reputation of being a deep thought writer. Early in his career with the three arid metafictions that make up the New York trilogy, Auster adroitly surfed some of the less gnarly waves of literary postmodernism. In 13 further novels, most recently Sunset Park, he has riffed repetitiously on a small handful of themes, existential dread, the randomness of life, the burden of being a writer. Auster's novels are samey, a male narrator, usually a writer or a writer's substitute, muses on the accident or the crime or the accidental crime that knocked his life off course. Lately, Auster's reputation has ebbed. In 2009, the New Yorker critic James Wood published an essay called Paul Auster's Shallowness, which parodied Auster's plots. He does nothing with cliché except to use it, Wood scoffed. I won't go on any further than that. Anyone have any questions or challenges? Hello. Um, Rob was talking earlier about the expectation that um, there would be some exciting mad novels perhaps uh, on the offer soon. Um, and I'm just wondering, you mentioned commerciality. How could this be that they may be published? And I don't know. When I said that, it was a bit of, um, I'd love to see that happening. The, the fact is, I don't know how confident I am uh, that that is the case. Actually, uh, it may well happen, and that would, for me, that would be great because I just I love things that are outrageous. I love things that are pro that provoke me, that shock me. But I do think that for all sorts of reasons, many of which we're very familiar with, the publishing industry, like so many others, has become extremely timid and fearful. Yeah, it, not across the board, but by and large, it's a trend. Um, one, I, I think it's hard to deny, um, because of this kind of fear that you're going to uh, get the mob after you, that kind of thing. You know, the crowds, the online crowds, and they're going to they're gonna come for you, and they're going to ruin your livelihood or whatever, and publishers are afraid of that. And so, um, insofar as that continues to be the case, then there probably won't be any um, wild... Uh, you know, provocative, outrageous, um, gen genuinely challenging uh, novels coming our way anytime soon. But I, I don't know. I, again, I, I just don't have the um, my view of the publishing world and what goes on in it is, is, qu is kind of partial and in incomplete. So uh, it, it, these, is, these are all quite intuitive answers, and I can't say with any certainty that that's how it's going to play out. I'm probably a bit too pessimistic about this stuff, too. An, oh, sorry. And then with a, another film that came out recently, a film called Blonde, oh, where, yeah. they, where it was kind of the opposite. There was problems with the subject matter of, of Marilyn Monroe. But, uh, uh, well, again, but, be but a beautifully made Amazingly film. Amazingly made. And I heard it reviewed on Arena, and they just completely panned it. Like, and I was like, and I, it kind of, I thought it would be bad, because a lot of these, you know, this kind of obsession with, like, Diana and Marilyn Monroe, you know. But actually, I did watch... Blonde, and I thought, and, and I'm a David Lynch fan. I could, see, I mean, David Lynch was. I mean, if there was any problem, there was too much David Lynch all over it. It was a bit of a, but it was an extraordinary. It was actually, I thought it was amazing. A, an amazing film. film. I'm glad you agree. Yeah. But that I worry, I worry about that. That reviewers miss. Like the only people who picked up on the Dunkirk thing was a, an Indian historian, for instance, who picked up on the on the sort of lack of that it was so white and that it was very. You know, the first word in Dunkirk is "I am English," and there's like. Churchill's, I mean, yeah, the, uh, yeah, it's, you know, but, but no reviewer picked up on that. Um, is there a literary, do you find that with book reviews that, uh, the, where there's something being reviewed and they're missing those sorts of symbols, perhaps? 
I don't know. I, just the thing about Dunkirk, I didn't know about that. I, I, I really loved that film, but I didn't know there was... Uh, I, I didn't catch that, that there was this whitewashing thing going on. I, I take your word for it. Um, but, but with the, the blonde thing, uh, it strikes me as an example. I got interested in that film because the reviews were... Uni I had no interest in seeing it before, and then I saw that the reviews were universally damning. Uh, but they all seem to be echoing one another, and so I found there was kind of a source review that was utterly damning, but n not on aesthetic grounds, mm. on ideological, political, uh, kind of culture war grounds. And it was almost like to then give that film a good review would show yourself to be morally uh, insufficient, to be a bad person or something like that. This is what I think is going on. And so everybody felt kind of a, a panic that they needed to to pan this film, and so they did. And I finally get around to watching it and thought it was this aesthetic. I mean, it, it had its flaws, but it was a wonderful film. And uh, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a personal prejudice coming out here, but I feel that the literary world has not been any more immune than the film world to this kind of um, almost exclusively ideological um, evaluation at the, ex at the expense of, uh, a more of, of a literary or aesthetic uh, or a qualitative evaluation. Um, I, I, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but... It's, yeah, I mean... I, an ideological critique is almost the least interesting thing you can do with a work of art, almost. Um, it has value and interest, and sometimes it's very... It's, sometimes it's important. Sometimes it's important to do that if there's a, an hugely popular work of art that has sort of coded fascistic tendencies in it, as all Marvel movies and all Star Wars movies do. Um, it's, it's worth pointing that out. It's important to point it out. But when you get into something like, it's something that's made as a work of art. Now, I've not seen Blonde because I have two small children and all I can watch is Paw Patrol, but, um, <laughs> which has serious fascistic tendencies, by the way. <laughs> um, I was going to say. Big time, yeah, really worrying. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think something that is made as a work of art, you know, you can do, do the ideological critique, but then for the love of God, move on to something more interesting. Uh, you know, let's talk about some set of aesthetic criteria. And like a genuinely moral engagement with the work of art goes way beyond ideological, you know, uh, enemy spotting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can do some interesting moral thinking. You can think about values using a work of art, and good criticism mm -hmm. often does that. Susan Sontag, Susan you mentioned, Sontag, was always morally engaged, with the work, but it never had a, a, well, to me, it never had a hectoring, sanctimonious tone or just an ideological point scoring. It was a deeper moral engagement. That's it, yeah. But that, you know, uh, but, but it, it, the, the ideological kind of enemy spotting looks like moral engagement, and it makes you feel like you're doing some useful thinking. And it gets the likes. People and it gets will likes, like it. People will retweet yeah. it, you yeah. know? Uh, Fascists are bad. People don't like them. Yeah. Um, and with good cause. Oh, the, do, do we have time for more questions? Or no? We can, yeah. Okay, one there. Oh, there's one in the back, too. Okay, so this one. Uh, hello. Um, I think I'm right in thinking that Jonathan Cape was the one who published Lolita back years ago. I can't remember exactly. But is there a publisher that you think is publishing great work at the moment or that is publishing a little bit more daringly? They're all the same yeah. publisher. <laughs> you know, the there's just this one corporation at the top, and then it yeah. just goes out. Rob? Um, hmm. I don't really know, but I, I do have, I do suspect that a lot of the, uh, I just some of the more interesting stuff that comes my way tends to come from kind of indie publishers. I remember a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of hype, justifiably so, about Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, yeah. You know, every, every, every book they put out for the first couple of years. Mm. But do you know these? They put out these beautifully um, kind of... The non-fiction is white, I think, and the fiction is blue. So yeah. it's very sparse and elegant. The, the way they do it in France, you know, they don't have the kind of ornate book covers in, in French publishing that we do in the Anglophone world. Mm. And Fitzcarraldo seemed to be taking a leaf from their book. However, it's about five or six years on now, and I found that while they initially kind of offered uh, a, a, an interesting and vital um, alternative to the kind of standard by numbers novel that maybe some of us aren't really that interested in. 
uh, it's created its own set of conformist uh, yeah. conventions and so That's on. True. And so it's, there's now a kind of Fitzcarraldo editions book. Yeah. It's, frag <laughs> it's written in fragmentary yeah. prose. Or all one paragraph. Or all one paragraph. Yeah. And it's a mixture of nonfiction and memoir and reportage and yeah, yeah. black and white photographs of the, the, the person's mother. I mean, they, put, they publish Annie Erno, and I mean, she's phenomenal. It's great. So I, I, still, I yeah. still buy some of their books sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so they've done, you know, Annie Erno, yeah. you know, I've come to authors. I remember NYRB classics. Uh, I, I guess they're still doing it, but for a couple of years, everything I read by then, they were just unearthing books from the past. Mm. But uh, sometimes famous authors, but not such a famous book, or sometimes authors who've just been kind of forgotten about. And they were... They just kept hitting home run after home run for a while. Every book I found from them was, was wonderful. I'd like to think they're still doing that. I haven't really checked in. Do you not want to mention your own publishers? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, usually Bloomsbury, uh, pu my first publisher was the Lilliput Press, who are great. They're Irish. Um, and, uh, and then Bloomsbury published them. Uh, and they're my kind of fiction publisher ongoing. But the most recent one was by uh, Swift Press. Um, it's a new indie uh, UK publisher, and um, I get the feeling that they, you know, all this kind of uh, caustic, prejudicial stuff about the kind of blandness of the culture at the moment, I kind of feel uh, that they're on board with that, you know, that's probably why they wanted to publish me, uh, a, a similar way of looking at things, so yeah, I think they're good. I would also like to express great admiration for Lilliput for publishing a book of literary essays um, and obviously tanking their year-end balance sheet by, <laughs> by doing that. Um, a brave decision. I really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs>